Sarah Lita, bonus Sarah. <laughs> it's great to see you today. And uh, we're excited about this show. Lena, this is great. And we saw the reviews from last week. People really love it. They love the content. It's a great energy that you and I have had for five, six, seven years now. And it's just great to be doing the show with you talking about the Sicilian culture of Louisiana. Likewise, Charles. So that's what we're doing here. We are bringing to you all things Italian American here in Louisiana. And we hope you are enjoying the show. You know, Charles, when I was in Florence, which we talked about on the last show, everyone was saying, buona sera, buona sera. And I, thought, to... I thought, I'm, pro I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I guess we pronounce, we Italians pronounce things differently all over the place. I, I think we do, whether it's a, a hard A or soft A, E as well, I, we get our vowels a little bit different, especially in Louisiana, where we put a Cajun and a a country accent as well to Italian. It's a whole different <laughs> language. And I'm up here in Monroe and it's a little bit different in Monroe than it is in New Orleans too. Oh, wow. Yeah. I also noticed that in Florence, they said, ciao, ciao. When they said, ciao, they said it twice quickly. Ciao, 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 ciao. I like that. It's and, and some people I overheard on their phone as I was walking by go, ciao, 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 ciao. And I thought, wow, they made a little song out of it. And I heard that more than a couple of times. And I thought, cool. Ciao, 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 ciao. ciao I'm thinking you're probably ciao, writing a song right now, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write a song, Charles. Yeah, you got to. Ciao, ciao, ciao. <laughs> so, Charles, let's talk about your uh, Little Palermo app because I, I checked it out. It is fabulous, Lena. We have over 50 stops on Little Palermo, and it keeps growing as I go different places in New Orleans and Louisiana. So the main thing was Little Palermo, as you know, was West uh, Esplanade Avenue, the river, to about Rampart Street and about to the cathedral in New Orleans. And it, people lived a little bit outside around it. But the heart of it was St. Mary's Church. And, and, and that was an area where you had Bracado's ice cream on Ursline. You had the Beauregard House had a great story there where the Italian wine merchants lived there. We had all these this very concentrated. And obviously, the Italians were working on the docks unloading the ships. And the Italians were the first to bring in bananas to America. So that they were doing this, so much stuff right there in the French market from about 1880 to 1920. It was called Little Palermo. Which is where, please no squeeze it a banana came from. I can almost imagine that, that policeman being there and your dad, somebody singing the song to him. You can just see it. Really it really happened, yeah. It did. No doubt about it. And then they were working so hard. And then we took a little Palermo app. And as we would lie, find out little things, it kept growing. You know, the Italian piazza that Frank Maselli has done such a great job with. Yes. The museum. That uh, we put on the app. And that's obviously in the warehouse district in New Orleans. So it kept growing. And then as the Italians moved, Ricardo's and Venetia's, uh, um, Mendina's moved to the mid-city area. And if you're in town, you got to go to Ricardo's. Yeah. So, so Charles... If somebody comes to New Orleans and they got their phone and they're interested in the Italian history, they just need to go to awe.news and there it is. So, Selena, we've actually put great videos in there. We've interviewed people like Frank Maselli. We've interviewed you. We've interviewed so many other uh, chefs of Italian, uh, Tony Bracato. We've interviewed Bracatos. We've interviewed two Tonys. We've interviewed Andrea. It's just fabulous. It is great. So, um, if you're visiting New Orleans or if you just are local and you want to check this out and do a little little Palermo, a little little Palermo tour, just go to awe.news on your phone and check it out. It's wonderful all the work you've done, Charles Yates. Absolutely. It's going to be, it's so much fun because Italians are fun by nature. I mean, obviously your, your dad brought so much great energy in to be an Italian and you have it. And I think I, I said, I became a fan of your dad's when I was 13, when he came and spoke to the high school. 
So <laughs> it's great to be doing this. Awesome, Charles. All right, so I wanted to tell you about my background today because I'm going to do a different background, different Italy background. <laughs> so this is a photo of Procida, which is located in the Gulf of Naples, and it's a tiny, colorful island. And it was officially it officially earned the title Italy's Capital of Culture for 2022. And Procida is the first island to win this designation since the award was started in 2014. Like many Mediterranean islands and coastal Italian towns, Procida is known for its colorful buildings, which you can see, and impressive sea views. The island has a population of only about 10,000 inhabitants, but its history dates all the way back to approximately the 15th century BCE. How about that? Wow, that is, it is what a beautiful looking town. I mean, it's just yeah. amazing. And it's just, it's kind of neat that they knew to do that right by Naples. So you can take a, a little boat, a ferry boat over there and, and spend some time in the town. And you know, uh, what's great right now too, if you, I don't know, like at, I work out at home, so I have, I have a treadmill and I like to put my iPad on the treadmill and do a little walking tour. So you can actually go on YouTube and you can look up a walking tour of Procida and just it's just so much fun to go along. There's no, you know, talking or anything. They kind of have little captions about what you're seeing, but you can find that on YouTube and it's lovely. It looks fabulous. Lee. That's a great idea to showcase different places to see in Italy. I mean, yeah. Why would you go there? Yes. All right. So um, you told me something interesting I wanted to ask you about. You told me that two months before Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, an Italian an Italian did it. And, and I, I, tell us about that. So, so Lena, I want to take it a little bit further back to Leonardo da Vinci, so you can really comprehend what's going on. In the 15th century, da Vinci is designing helicopters and wings that flap. So Italians were already thinking about flying. And in the, uh, we actually took a balloon to the North Pole in the early 1900s. The, uh, the first people to use an airplane in warfare were the Italians with the Ottoman Turk War in like 1910. So then World War I rolls around, the Italians already have an air force after it ends. The Americans were decades behind. 1923, there's an Italian engine being built for planes on pontoons because there were no runways, there was no airports. So they had the idea to make seaplanes. And this guy takes a seaplane and leaves Rome. He goes to Africa and he flies from Africa to Brazil, which is closer than New York to Paris. And then he goes into the Amazon. His name was Francesco Di Pinedo. And the name of the, of the aircraft was the Santa Maria after Columbus. Wow. So he That's sails up. Go ahead. No, it's, keep going. Okay. He sails up the Amazon and he cuts over to the Caribbean. And he actually takes his plane, the Santa Maria, to where the boat, the Santa Maria, had been. And he's just got chills that 400 years late, earlier, Columbus had been these same places in a boat. And then he leaves wow. Havana and he lands in the Mississippi River in New Orleans. And wow. the Italians are there because that was a little Palermo. So he lands, this Italian lands in March of 1927, right there in, a, in New Orleans on the river. Oh my gosh, how come we don't know about this? I mean, I've never heard of this. I, I didn't either. And I was out at the, the Lakefront Airport. There's, there's a, a painting by um, Xavier Gonzalez did eight murals that are up there. And they're just amazing paintings uh, of different aviation of the 30s and, and I guess the 20s. So I saw this, this painting and I'm reading it and it's talking about it and it's the plane landing in Brazil. So there's a great painting of it, it's about eight foot square. Yeah. And as I started reading about this guy, I'm thinking, how do I not know about this? So I started researching more and more. He then, it gets even better. He leaves New Orleans, he goes, he's headed to California when he stops in Arizona to refuel, they, they're really not used to what's going on. And the guy refueling, and he's on the water, is spilling fuel. And the guy is smoking a cigarette, oh. throws the cigarette on the water, the plane burns up and oh, sinks. Oh, no. What a disaster. But the Italians. That's a bad ending. <laughs> no, it's not the ending, though. Oh. It's not. It's only the, it's only the beginning. Okay. Really. So the Italians make a new plane for him and get it to New York within 30 days. Oh my and God. And he, he goes from uh, Arizona to New York, picks up his new plane, and he has to bring it back to New Orleans to continue like this, 
this journey so that would show is uninterrupted. So he starts back in New Orleans, goes back to, goes up to Chicago and from Chicago into New York. And then he crosses the Atlantic about a month or two after Lindbergh had crossed. That is such a cool story, Charles. Are you going, going to do like a in-depth for your, um, for your on news? Are you going to do it? We are. And we, we, when we start showing the Sicilian migration, we want to end with, you know, some of the Sicilian contributions, you know, like, like cars. We have the Ferrari, the Bugatti, Lamborghini, Maserati. There's so many Italian engineering products. We really think more of about pasta and wine and song than we do about Italian engineering. Right. And, and, you know, I want to showcase that Leonardo da Vinci, we didn't end some at some point in time with making machinery. And in fact, yeah. I, was at, I was at the Dixie Brewery recently and the bottling line was made in Italy. They had Italians come in and install the oh, bottle. Of course it was. <laughs> of course. So, so we, we're going to have fun showing Italian aviation. And there's actually a lot more to the story that I'm telling you now, but I, I won't go into all the details. People yeah. have to stay tuned and watch it. It's just all right, a great so we're gonna story. We're going to stay tuned for this, for this, what you're going to do with this. Yes. Great. Great, Charles. Okay. So I have a check this out for today. We've got Valentine's Day coming up. And how about... I'm not sure what everybody's doing or wants to do, but how about making a Sicilian Valentine's Day dinner? I found this online at theyellowtable.com, and it's citrus marinated olives to start, then pistachio crusted tuna with agrodolce, sweet and sour red onions, winter citrus salad with arugula and ricotta salata, Bittersweet chocolate pudding cakes with Grand Meunier whipped cream. And wow. have a dry sparkling rosé or Mount Etna white wine from Sicily if you can get it. So how does that sound? Doesn't that sound yummy? Oh, my God. <laughs> you, got, you got me thinking. I, I was reading that list when I saw it on the – you sent me, and it's, it's an amazing list. And I think I got to find this Mount Etna wine as well. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and you get that too. But the, the items there, the citrus olives, that's an interesting – connection you know yeah that I mean? sounds delicious so if you if that sounds good to you and you want to get your stuff together to make this romantic sicilian style dinner copy this link down to get to the yellow table.com or i guess make up your own recipe <laughs> <laughs> also i looked around to see um valentine's day dinner specials in and around new orleans and here's a link to uh, go to to find out where you can you know, if you want to go out or pick up and it's nolaweekend.com slash Valentine's Day Dinner Deals New Orleans. So copy this one down. Yay! Well, I will. Yes, this is great. You know, Valentine's Day is such a, a great day. And I, I, I got to think I'll say, does it go to Valentino? Are we talking Italian as well with Valentine's Day? I don't know. You, you got to figure that one out now. I got it. I got to learn that one as well. I do know <laughs> that one of my ancestors actually was, was it, it Italians in the early days in New Orleans were boxers. Boxing was really big in New Orleans. And one of my cousins actually became a, a pretty successful boxer. He left and went to LA and he boxed with Rudy Valentino. He would, he would teach him how to box for the movies. Wow. Yes. That's exciting. <laughs> his, name, his name was String Bean uh, Cephalo. <laughs> String Bean. String Bean. Not his mom. I guess he was skinny, obviously. I guess so. I mean, what a name for a boxer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he must have been good if his name was String B. <laughs> I guess that's what made him good. You have to defend that name if that's what your nickname was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Charles, guess what it's time for? It's time for Charles Celebrates Culture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lena. <laughs> One of the great things I love, I'm in Monroe, Louisiana, about 250 miles north of New Orleans, and a lot of Sicilians left to come up here and, and, and actually work on the railroads and pick cotton. So my, my family has actually lived up here. And, and yesterday, last night, Lieutenant Governor Nungesser was giving an award to my uncle. The restaurant's been open for 57 years. Oh. 
and it, it's, it was in the heart of what was Little Italy of Monroe, but they built a, a, a convention center and they took most of the Italians, got relocated. So now we're very much assimilated, but the restaurant is still close by, almost 60 years old now. It's just a great thing. And there's so, you can just see the culture up here. There's a lot of, of older Italian families that have been around for a long time. Everybody's done great. Um, they used to be two Italian clubs up here, and they were part of a, a larger network of about six clubs with Shreveport, Alexandria, Bunky, and Baton Rouge. And they got together every year, Labor Day weekend, for a convention of all Italians. And it was just so much fun. So they still have that, that energy. There's still St. Joseph altars. There's still great Italian dining. It's just a really great place to come. And just north of here, you cross into Arkansas, is Lake Village, Arkansas, and Sunnyside Plantation, which brought in 100 families from Italy, not Sicily, in 1895 to work that plantation. And they have a museum up there that showcases what happened to all those families. And they have on March 3rd of every year, the, well, excuse me, the first Sunday in March, they have a pasta, a spaghetti dinner for about 3,000 people. And they, wow. and they got all the permits this year. It's going to be a you know, drive-through for 3,000. Oh my gosh, drive through? <laughs> drive through. Oh, that you know what? That's wonderful that they're doing that. Yes. And then on the other side of the river is a town called Belzoni, Mississippi. And Belzoni was an Italian explorer. I haven't yet figured out why they named the town after this Italian explorer from the early 1800s. I have, did a a lot. Feeling, I have a feeling you're going to figure it out. <laughs> You, you got that right. I'll probably be there tomorrow and I'm going to learn out why Belzoni, Belzoni is in the, like the Mississippi Delta is it's called Belzoni. There must've been a lot of Italians there. And in fact, not too far from here is a town called Sicily Island. So oh, it just cool. shows the influence of Sicilians in this area to, to take those jobs in the 1880s. They were uh, tough times. Many of them had uh, was sharecropping and had to pay high fees and you had to spend the money you got from cropping sharecropping at the company store. So it was really hard to save enough to leave, but eventually they left and they went and opened up grocery stores and then restaurants. And two generations later, you know, the people are lawyers and doctors and doing a lot of great things up here. That's fantastic. So Charles, I want to go back to um, Monroe for a second and ask you again about Geno's. Tell, tell us more about Geno's. I mean, you mentioned to me that your, your middle name is Gino. And you were named after. Yeah, that's Gino, Gino is my grandfather. Okay. And, and uh, you know, my going back, I have all of my eight great grandparents are Sicilian and they all left little towns in Italy and came to Louisiana. So as you know, you're, you've got family from Sala Peru to so do I. Yep. There's another town called Bisakina, there's Shefalu, Vigory, there's all these other villages. And when I look at the cemetery here in Monroe, you can see where people are from. So my, uh, Grandfather Gino, he was very active with the Knights of Columbus. And the, the legend is, is he would cook often for them. And they would say, Gino, you need to open up a restaurant. Uh, so in 1964, Gino opened up Gino's. Okay. I was four years old. Um, my middle name is after Gino. Okay. And then he was a great character in town. Uh, he, uh, he became an honorary fraternity member at the university here because they went at one fraternity just kind of adopted Gino's as the place to go hang out. So he, he was doing that. He, uh, he made great lasagna. My grandmother made a great salad dressing and the soup, the minestrone. My uncle loves to cook. They took it over. He's got great things. And then my cousin created cheese bread with an olive salad on it. So when I go places now, I ask him if you're from Monroe, if you've been to Gino's, and I get great stories. We've got a great video on Gino's. Terry Bradshaw has eaten here. The, the, uh, the guys of Dynasty, Duck Dynasty people have eaten here. I mean, it's just a list of people that have been here, besides now Lieutenant Governor, uh, that's been involved at Geno's. So it's, it's a great, it's little mom and pop place, but outdoor dining too. Perfect. So uh, yeah, take a trip to Monroe and go to Geno's. And, and, and I do go to Geno's. And I want to also say there's two other places, there's Genduza's and there's Casio's to, to make sure that, you know, I don't get too biased in this show right now. So if you're Aww. here, a couple other places that are also Italian dining, but clearly Gino's has the caricature of my family. And it's got, it's almost a museum when you go in there. There's a lot of pictures of Monroe in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s of the Italian culture. So when you're there, you can get a lesson of what's, what's going on. Well, that sounds great, Charles. And thank you for your Charles Celebrates Culture <laughs> segment today. I loved it. 
<laughs> thank you, Lena. Thank you. All right, Charles, it's time for La Musica. And our guest today is the lovely Vanessa Racci. Uh, she's from New York, but she performed here at the Kenner Italian Heritage Festival in 2019. I met her at the Columbus Day Parade in New York City, and she is really focused on uh, Italian heritage, and I think that's wonderful. So we're going to show a um, fantastic video of her singing at the Jazz Band Ball, which is by Nick LaRocca, Charles. That is wonderful that she's doing that. She's also um, working on an album that's going to be called Jazzy Italian, and it's going to be the history of Italian-American influence on jazz through song from 1917 New Orleans to modern day. She also has a perfect album to go with your Valentine's Day dinner. It's beautiful. It's called Italiana Fresca, and you can get her um, music on iTunes, Amazon Music, and Spotify. You can follow her on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at Vanessa Racci, and I'll put that right here so you can, you can find her. And so, yeah, th she really always includes Italian history in her shows, and she, she cares about it very much. So we just love her, and we hope you enjoy this video of her performance. That's great. this. It's the turn of the century New Orleans. I sound like Sophia from the Golden Girls. <laughs> and hopefully I don't look like her. Um, and Sicilian Americans are immigrating to New Orleans in droves. And um, they were an oppressed group at the time um, and lived and worked in the same neighborhoods as the oppressed black population of the time. And one of those Italians was named Nick La Rocca. He was a very talented musician. And he claims to have created jazz music sing single-handedly, which we all know is a major overstatement. <laughs> but what he did do was create the very first Dixieland jazz band and the very first jazz recordings in history. So we're going to pay homage to his 1917 instrumental that he recorded right here in New York City, and it's called At the Jazz Band Ball. Nickel would buy a jug jigger of respectable rye. All the players and the honky tonks would have to work on a slide. One, two was known to a few, and some steady habituates to. Then the word of mouth spread around the south. Very under new. You better take that jazz band ball. Cause it's the fall of them all All five musicians in a small saloon he Inventing the ragtime tune They made up their own brand Without a note up on the stand And then they called it D-I-X-I-E Hot Pan Alley Candyland Sir, you know he caught on What's more, he was strictly bon on Cause like the winner at the starting gate The music got it and gone It moved from over the tracks 
into the society shacks. It was wonderful and deductible from the income tax. You better take that jazz band ball, cause it's the ball of them all. When the trumpet player plays his monologue, all the people shout, who's that dog? And then you ask them why they yell. They kind of grin and say, well, when the band plays J double Z, it's a B A double L. You know we caught on What's more, it was strictly bon ton Cause like the winner at the starting gate The music got it and gone And jazz moved from over the tracks Into the society shacks It was wonderful and deductible From your income tax You better take that jazz band ball Cause it's the ball of them all When the trumpet player plays his monologue All the people shout, who's that dog? And you ask them why the hell They kinda grin and say, well When the band plays J-double-Z It's a B-A-double-L When the band plays J-double-Z It's a B-A-double-L Well, they call the D-I-A Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> that is just great. That is just great. And I love the fact that the Nick LaRock is getting more attention because he's also from Sala Peruta. Uh, they've got a, a lot there for him in Sala Peruta, but we don't have much for him in New Orleans. And the fact that he's getting some attention is just fabulous that Vanessa is doing that. So kudos to her for really doing her history, her homework, and, and Italian culture. Absolutely. She's fantastic and just lovely. And we hope that we see her again here in Louisiana, too. I'll be looking forward to it. I'm going to have front row seats. <laughs> all right, Charles. Well, I really enjoyed the show today. I hope all of you out there watching enjoyed it as well. We've got certainly have a lot, a lot more coming up for you. So we're going to say. Bonus Sarah and Lena, I'm having so much fun. Bonus Sarah and Lena, and we'll see you soon. Ciao, 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 ciao,